and especially those who are joining us online. Can you hear me? Yeah. Those online, can you please wave your hands? Can you hear us? Yeah, yes, I can. Yeah, that's great. Fantastic. Now, um, just, uh, thank you for uh, being with us uh, this afternoon, giving up your Saturday afternoon to be with us, and especially Carl Wright, our speaker. In fact, I didn't know that Carl had written a book last year, and in fact, he's uh, just left some uh, uh, sort of copies at the back. And I'll read, actually, I had uh, a bio data on, on Carl, but I'll read what um, is actually um, written in a, sort of about him in the book. Uh, it's, um, Carl's book is written from the perspective of a grassroots activist, Commonwealth diplomat, and local government leader. Carl's uh, recollections provide rare insights into the relationship between intergovernmental organizations, global associations of mayors and trade unions, and the effects of political and social advocacy. He draws extensively on his experience of working in the Commonwealth, the United Nations, and the European Union at senior level. During the past 50 years, Carl has been engaged with world leaders and political icons from across the globe, uh, including Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Indira Gandhi, Julius Nereli, Srinivas Rampal, uh, Fidel Castro, Usang Chu Chi, Ban Ki Moon, uh, and Helen Clark, and Bob Hawkes. Carl, and, and in fact, uh, at the, uh, he, he reflects his experience of what it was like to be there, he puts it. Carl, thank you for coming us, uh, for being with us, and uh, speaking on the SDGs. The floor is yours. Thank you, Guillermo, and, and uh, I didn't really expect a, a plug for the book, but I much appreciate it, and, and certainly uh, I'd like to thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was getting very impressed with the kind of programs you've put on, and I've been Recording watching in progress. some of the things you've laid on in, in pre previous months and years, and you know, congratulations to your, your UNA branch for putting on such interesting uh, events. And again, also let me thank everybody for coming out on a, a bright but cold autumn day uh, to join us and also colleagues online. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and um, you mentioned um, Nelson Mandela, who I had the privilege of meeting once or twice uh, in my, my work, and uh, I always like to start with a quote from him, my favorite quote, where he said that when you climb a great mountain, when you get on top of a big mountain and you reach the summit, you suddenly realize there are many more mountains to climb, many more summits to reach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a bit like that with the no. United Nations and with the SDGs. You, you, you achieve something, but then you need to go forward much further, and sometimes you do fall back, sadly. So let me just um, spend the next 25 or so minutes giving a bit of an overview. And what I'd like to focus on is, is very much um, the local dimension of the SDGs. I think people will be aware, I'm sure, from the UNA members about the, the wider United Nations context. But what I really want to demonstrate today is how those SDGs are applicable in places like Leamington, like Warwick, uh, indeed anywhere in the UK, uh, as well as in developing countries and, and globally. And in particular, I want to sort of bring in the local government dimension, which is something I've been working on for quite a number of years, um, and, and show how linking into the SDGs, which is being done across the world at the local level, is, is particularly relevant. So let me just give a bit of background. Um, maybe the next, next slide, thank you. deals with negotiating the SDGs. Uh -huh. oh. yeah. Right. Well, maybe just while we're looking for it, it's, it's really just um, a bit of the history. And um, some of you may know that the SDG build on something called the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, which were in operation earlier. But the um, SDGs are, are much more ambitious. 
much more universal. The MDGs were very much more focused on the um, on the um, uh, developing countries, whereas the SDGs, as I've already said, apply to Britain, apply to America, apply to European countries and developed countries, and all countries across the world. And they're, they're summarized in something called the Agenda for Sustainable Development 2030, which was adopted by the United Nations back in 2015. And I was privileged to be, having been a bit involved in some of the negotiations that went on in New York um, on the SDGs, mainly between the years 2012 and 2015. Oh, I hear it. Very good. <laughs> um, and uh, that agenda it was adopted um, by the General Assembly in, in 15, and um, I was involved with a number of other colleagues in, I guess, lobbying for certain aspects, uh, of which perhaps one of the key aspects was SDG 11 on sustainable cities and human settlements, which I'll come back to a bit later. Um, again, just to give you the, the, the headlines, which, which probably most of you know, uh, there are 17 main goals under the uh, agenda for sustainable development, which I'll, I'll explain in a minute. And then it gets more complicated. Uh, underneath those goals are no less than 169 targets spread across those 17 goals, uh, as well as uh, which, which you know, for example, what has to be achieved by 2030 under other cities, human settlements, poverty, uh, all the other SDGs. So it does actually try to put set some basically fairly broad base uh, goals. And then those goals are amplified by more detailed targets, which actually go into a bit more, bit more depth. Although they're still pretty, pretty sort of broad brush. And then there's also indicators, which are designed to measure what progress is being made, you know, what are the indicators of those targets being met over those 15 year period between 2015 and 2030. And built into the, the structure of the SDGs or the agenda for sustainable development is a review process. And just to blind you with, with initials, um, uh, VNRs are voluntary national reviews which are undertaken by national governments like the British government on what progress the UK has been making on, on meeting those SDG targets. Uh, and that's done uh, regularly, um, there's an annual meeting every July in New York with something called the, the High Level Political Forum, uh, which reviews country reports. Um, I mean, UK has submitted, I think, one or two. Um, most other UN members have submitted uh, reports as well, and, and different years have different have different um, focuses on different different SDGs. But basically, it covers the whole range. And then the VLR, which I'll come to later, is a fairly new innovation, which stands for Voluntary Local Reviews, which is primarily done by local governments, how a district like Warwick would be meeting these SDG commitments. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Right, um, a very big focus, and this is something else, you know, often you hear criticism of the United Nations or international commitments that they're very uh, nice, nice sounding declarations, but there's not much meat or not much implementation. And I think one of the positive things about the SDGs is that there's a very strong implementation mechanism uh, built into them, and also the, the ECI I mentioned already, the localizing. And what that means is there is very strong focus on implementation at the national level, which would mean in the case of the UK, um, the British government ensuring coordination among all departments, all ministries, that they all abide by the SDG targets uh, across government and, and even beyond that. And then of course there's also the, if you like, the vertical implementation at the, what might be the regional, sometimes in some countries the federal level, state level rather, and, and, and the local government level. Um, so there's those two kind of levels. And in most countries there are various committees coordination groups uh, which, which do all that kind of work uh, and I give some examples of that. I think the UK has been one of the more lax countries frankly <laughs> in, in taking this forward which has been disappointing. I remember even some years ago giving evidence to the um, House of Commons, uh, one of the, the, the committees on, on SDG implementation and it wasn't very positive at all. It has progressed a bit since then but you know, I'm not sure it's, it's really 
up to the standard of other countries. And this is, I think, a very interesting statistic. The OECD in Paris, Organization of Economic Development and Corporate, uh, uh, Corporation Development, uh, of, of the industrialized countries, uh, did a study not so long ago where they calculated that of the 169 targets, at least, at least 100 of those 169 should be implemented at the local level to be effective. No good doing it at the UN level, no good doing it at the Whitehall level. To be effective, they have to be implemented locally, and I'll explain that in a minute. Okay, next slide. Just briefly, um, just a couple of months ago in September, there was a, a SDG summit in New York um, that did the midterm review, because we're midterm between 2015 and 2030. So it's a good time to see where we're going, what progress is being made. Um, and that took place in September. And the rather, well, the extremely worrying message was that progress is much too slow, or in some cases, there's even a regression, a backward movement. And, you know, it, it was actually stated by the leaders, um, our, our global leaders, that the actual achievement of the SDGs by 2030 is now in real peril. Now, why does that happen? Obviously, there has been the impact of COVID. That's that set things back, especially for developing countries. Um, there's the growing impact and, and problems around climate change, which is having major impact not just on the SDG to do with climate, but, but more generally. And of course, there's the whole geopolitics, you know, the Ukraine war, the recent turmoil in the Middle East, but also, you know, countries like the UK, and the UK is not the only one, cutting back on its aid commitments on the support they've been giving um, to, to move things forward internationally. Brexit, another reason I think, which caused turbulence. Um, so I think, I think those are some of the reasons why we're not on track and we're not going to hit the SDG targets unless there's going to be a dramatic improvement in the next seven years. Okay, next slide. Right, let me go into a bit more, more detail over time. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll, I'll kind of run through it, but happy to go back in the discussion about individual SDGs. But what I want to demonstrate, and some of you may be familiar with these, some of you may not, um, what I want to demonstrate, as I said earlier, is how relevant these are to us at the local level here in Leamington, in Warwick, uh, Birmingham, wherever, and, and why they matter, um, not just at an international or at national level. Let me quickly run through them. SDG 1, no poverty. Um, just think of the homeless sitting in the streets. Think of you know, the poverty we've got in, in our own streets uh, in, in Britain, one example, and how local authorities, for example, need to deal with that. No hunger. Think of food banks. Think of the things that are happening you know, in terms of poverty, uh, food poverty in, in the UK. Good health. Well, obviously COVID was a major issue, but there's also issues around <coughs> primary health care. Uh, this, this, this goal also touches on things like health aspects of pollution, the whole debate we've had in London and elsewhere about the low emission zone, you know, uh, those are sort of issues where, again, the local government, whether it's through the Mayor of London or Birmingham or elsewhere, and Midlands, has, has a direct role to play. Education, number four, schools, our whole interaction with schools, not just primary, obviously secondary education as well, is another factor. Um, SDG 5, gender equality. This, this goes into quite a lot of issues, some of the obvious issues about equality, including representation in public bodies, and you know, councillors maybe, having female councillors and mayors, but also some of the, the more tricky issues, which you know, do sadly apply in the UK, like uh, forced labour, violence against women, all those things are relevant to us, not just countries elsewhere. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Well, I, I, I spent a lot of time in Kent in Canterbury, and I can tell you the way the waterways and the beaches are being polluted by our water companies is an utter and total disgrace. And that is another target, another target under the SG7 is to have clean water and sanitation, and frankly, we've been going backwards on that in the UK. SDG 7, clean energy. Well, again, we don't have to talk about this much. Uh, sustainable energy, I was just, funny enough, 
on, on Thursday visiting a very interesting initiative um, organised by E.O.N., the power company in, in London, City of London, where they're trying to expand district heating, which is, of course, much more sustainable than traditional fossil fuel uh, fired heating uh, in public buildings across the City of London. And that's something that's quite advanced in other countries like Sweden, and of course the whole issue around wind turbines, other forms of sustainable energy comes, comes into this. Good jobs and economic growth. Sure, we, we do want economic growth, as Mr. Starmer uh, and, and uh, Mr. Sunak uh, are always saying to us, but we also want good jobs, decent jobs, and this brings in the labor standards of the International Labor Organization, a body I was involved with quite a lot in my past work, um, on, on a whole range of things, you know, the issue of, of um, uh, no, no contracts for people, some of the Amazon working conditions. So I think all those issues about decent working conditions, decent jobs, uh, comes into this, this area as well as having the, the economic growth. Okay, um, what have we got? Uh, number nine, innovation and infrastructure. Well, this is anything from roads, potholes, you name it, to, to the more substantial infrastructure. Of course, some of that is done at national level, uh, but again, so much of that is the responsibility of our local authorities a district or at a county or at city government level. Ten. Now that's a very interesting uh, SDG. That was very controversial during the negotiations and some of the countries like Britain tried to oppose having it in because they felt it was a bit too political with inverted commas. Uh, what it basically means is, is fighting income and wealth inequalities within as well as between countries and I'm sufficiently old and you know, might, might remember this to remember way back in the late 1970s there was something called the United Nations New International Economic Order which had a kind of struck line saying equality between but also within countries and of course the whole neoliberalism of Reagan and Thatcher in the 80s and 90s has swept that away and if you you know plough through as I've acted for my sins some of the studies like Thomas Piketty on inequality and capital, um, you'll see how huge the inequalities have become since, since the 1970s. And this is a bit of an attempt at international to try and turn things back again, and uh, I think something really positive. Right, sustainable cities and communities. Um, I did mention this, and I'll just go into a little bit more detail. Uh, I'll find the right bit of paper. <laughs> Um, but this, this just to give you a flavour of the kind of issues that um, come up here. It's, it's very much to do with the urbanisation agenda. And you know, the, um, there's been a growing realisation of how important cities and urban centres are. And most of the world's population is, is now urban or will be very soon. And the UN and other bodies have really recognised that it's so important to address urbanisation as a global issue. And, and for example, on climate, you know, cities are the main emitters of carbon. So again, we're talking about the local level. If you can reduce carbon emissions, if you can address urbanisation at the um, at the local level, then then you can achieve some important some important goals. Which is more organised. And I'll just give you one example of, of one of the targets, which which I'm sure will strike. Um, um, Okay, here we go. Um, by 2030, this is target number 11.2, provide access to safe, affordable, accessible and sustainable transport systems. Sounds familiar? Yeah. Uh, for all, improving road safety, noting by expanding public transport, with special attention to the needs of those vulnerable situations, women, children, Persons with disabilities and other persons. And there's also um, another one which is directly again related to the local level, 11.7. Uh, this fact, there's most of the targets related to local level here. Uh, by 2030, provide universal access to safe, inclusive, and accessible green and public spaces. Which, of course, I, I'm pleased to see you have here in Leamington, walking across from the station, but many other cities don't. Uh, particularly for women and children, older persons and persons with disabilities. So some broad but really important targets um, related to the urban environment. 
SDGs 12, responsible consumption, well, this gets you into things like recycling, um, having, you know, green bins and, and all those, those kind of things, but the whole circular economy argument, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, and uh, quite a lot more besides. Right, um, SDG 13, protect the planet. Now this is really the, the climate change SDG. And again, I want to just give a little bit more information. I'll leave for time. Yep, another five, ten minutes. A um, little bit more information on this, because I think it's, it's so relevant. Um, although having said that, it's the climate change target or goal. Um, many of these other goals, consumption, cities, infrastructure, growth, of course, all feed into climate, so it's not just you know, one silo, it's a cross-cutting thing, which, which you know, most of the SDGs are, but you can't just see one SDG in isolation. And um, if I just give one example of um, the relevant bit, which again I would need to find, and I should know it off by heart by now. <laughs> um, it's, it's really bringing in, you know, some of the core issues around um, climate change, reaching net zero, and so forth. I'll talk a little bit more, more about that in the context of, of, um, of Canterbury. 14, we're getting there. Life below water. This, of course, is really affecting coastal regions, um, affecting especially those, those very low lying uh, countries across the world in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, and elsewhere, which are going to really suffer with, with climate change. And, and rising sea levels, but also you know, affects our, our, our own areas. I mean, I, I mentioned I, I live in Kent, um, near the Isle of Thanet, which has, of course, been part of the mainland for the last 500 years, but on, on rising sea levels, it'll become an island again, and there'll be huge flooding of more worryingly big coastal cities, whether you're talking about London, New York, Dhaka, and Bangladesh, and that poses, you know, as you all know, I'm sure, huge, huge problems. And with the COP28 coming up shortly, in, in Dubai, again, I think we're at a situation where action is, is terribly overdue and we need urgent action, but also at local level, because so much can be done at the local level on mitigation and adaptation, and, and that feeds into, as I say, 13 and, and 14 as well. Uh, 15, life on land. Um, well, you see the little tree symbol there, afforestation, trees, planting, um, but the whole biodiversity angle. And, and those of you who follow these things, uh, you may know there was, apart from the climate COP, the uh, UN conference last year in, in Sharm el-Sheikh, which I attended, um, there was also a, a, another COP in Montreal, Canada, in December last year, which was looking specifically at biodiversity. And of course, safeguarding biodiversity, you know, just have to watch the David Attenborough programs on television, um, and, and safeguarding our climate, are sides of the same coin, you know, they're, they're totally interlinked. So that's, that's you know, something that's, that's critical. Um, sorry, I'm being sort of, yeah, I'll keep some of this and I'm going to go back to the slides, other slides later. Uh, peace and justice, um, well, that's an interesting one. Again, that was a controversial inclusion during the negotiations. Some countries were uncomfortable, but it's a very important <coughs> addition because it brings in the whole issue about things like good governance, um, including tackling corruption, uh, ensuring that there's transparency in our governance, which isn't just an issue you know, at the national level, it's very much an issue at the local level as well, as, as, as we all know. So again, very much a local government dimension to that. And then finally, partnerships for the goals. Well, that's a bit cross-cutting. It, it touches on, on the, the practical issues on, on, for example, resource mobilization. How are we going to get money? How are we going to get resources? to implement all these things, whether it's at the international level through the UN, at the national level, especially in developing countries, uh, and also, at, as I mentioned, at, at local level, so partnerships. But also it touches on, on other forms of partnerships, for example, something which I know is very dear to the heart of UNA, uh, which is civil society partnerships. And I, I happen to be the, um, I was previously trustee of the UNA nationally, but I am, um, I'm also the vice chair of the Canterbury UNA, which, which apart from organising a wonderful uh, peace service every every year at Canterbury Cathedral, which, which is quite a nice high-profile event, um, it, it's trying to develop a partnership at, at grassroots level 
uh, including schools between Canterbury and Entebbe in Uganda. And it's those kind of civic partnerships, exchanges, trainings, if you like, that are also very relevant to our global world, as well as whatever happens at local government or at national government level. Right, so that gives you a, a quick run through, perhaps not so quick, of the SDGs, which you can come back to. Um, let's move on quickly to the last few slides. I've dealt with SDG 11, let's move on. Um, I've dealt with SDG 13 a little bit, and I've dealt a little bit with SDG 16. But uh, let me just come back to my main theme today, local action. Uh, how do we do this? Well, the most simple way, I remember going to um, Maidstone in Kent to visit Kent County Council, which is you know, the upper tier county government. And when I met with their, their planners, um, they had their, their countywide plan. And we did an interesting mapping exercise and said, well, these are the plans for transport, these are the plans for the environment, these are the plans for business development, for the economy, these are the plans for, for flood relief. And how do these relate to the different SDG targets? And lo and behold, we found that very many of the existing local government targets, plans, strategies, directly relate to SDG goals and targets. And that's not surprising if you think of the kind of things I've been mentioning. And it's just a question of doing a grid. And you're not reinventing the wheel. It's really relating what's on the ground, what's happening to, to, to the, the UN framework, which is a useful holistic framework. Um, you know, nobody's saying that we should superimpose some kind of abstract UN structure, which is highly theoretical, but rather we build it up from the ground up, we see what's going on and, you know, in, in the middle of the UK, you're probably not quite so concerned about coastal erosion, although it's a national issue, uh, but there's issues which are peculiar to Leamington or to Warwick, which, which can be integrated into the SDG framework. Um, obviously, it's important to have some kind of responsibility, some kind of leadership, so where possible, it's good to have a lead councillor and dedicated staff doing this work. Some of your bigger councils like Bristol have done this very effectively. Uh, and the Mayor Marvin Rees, who I was with recently at uh, the Commonwealth event in, in Rwanda. And um, I mentioned already at the beginning, you might recall, um, drawing up a voluntary local review, which is how your district, how your city, how your county is, is following the SDGs in line with your, your existing strategies. So a lot can be done without too much extra work. And of course, I think one of the, the important things is to draw on local expertise. I mean, local governments are incredibly stretched, lacking resources. Um, what we need to do is to use the local universities, the local academia, voluntary groups who've got expertise and feed this in together. Okay, next slide. And underlying all this, of course, we've got to get the public on side. And, and I think the you know, public generally is very concerned about sustainability, about energy crisis, about, about climate. But um, I think linking up with local schools, students, encouraging SDG projects, uh, producing materials like SDG banners, flags, videos, um, holding exhibitions on, on SDGs at the town hall maybe, or at the local churches, um, talks like this, um, events, is, is what we need to do. Now, the, the problem and I, I want to just underline this, is, I realise, is, is, as always, funding. Uh, UNA has very limited funds. No, the government is very stuck for money. And it, it is an issue, and I think Brexit has made it worse, because we did have before some, some European Union funds for this kind of work, which I certainly utilised in my, my time. So there, there is a problem, but I think a lot can be done informally like this. But if you want to go all the way, if, you know, if some magic future point, um, the, the magic monetary appears, um, it's worth looking at what the Flemish local government have done. And they produced an amazing booklet, or in English by the way, called the SDGs in your municipality, 5050 practical awareness raising examples. Now I say straight away, they, they are flushed, well flush is perhaps a bit derogatory, they're, they're fortunate in having a lot of funds from their national and Flemish governments and from the EU, which has funded this, but they do also put money in from their, their local governments. And just to give you an idea, um, the kind of things they've, they've done is quite amazing. You know, they, they produced 
uh, videos, they've produced all sorts of um, SDG quiz games uh, for children, they've linked policy, they've done a, an SDG treasure hunt, which I can tell you more about, an SDG shuffleboard, <laughs> and lots of you know, things which really might appeal to, to people. Um, so I think you know, some of these things, and we actually did one of these things in Canterbury, we did a, if I remember correctly, we did an SDG Wheel of Fortune, which is um, one of these big things you like have at fairs, you, you put around all the 17 SDGs, and it tells you what the, what the, the work's been done on different uh, goals. So lots of things can be done, but I appreciate it's a question of time and resources. So finally, I think I'm almost through. Um, let me just give you a couple of quick examples of, of what we've done in Canterbury, which I've been uh, involved with. We do have a, an SDG forum, which was set up a few years ago, uh, very much a voluntary networking organization. UNA is a member of that, but it goes beyond that. Uh, bodies like the, the Canterbury Society, which protects our, our local heritage, is involved, churches and others. Uh, we commissioned reports on relevant SDG issues in our district, including on poverty. In fact, one on poverty uh, was an updated version uh, done with help of university colleagues just, just recently. So it links the local poverty issues, like I mentioned, homelessness, other forms of poverty, to SDG number one targets. We engaged with the city council, also at elections. In other words, when there's been hustings, when there's been uh, candidates, we said, you know, what is your position on supporting sustainable development in our district and you know, try and make the politicians aware and committed to these issues. Uh, I mentioned already the work we did with Kent County Council and of course we did events. On one occasion we brought over the colleagues from Flanders, of course, easy jumping on the Eurostar, uh, although these days you have to go all the way to London and back again, which is a pain. Um, so so that's, that's another thing we, we can do. And then final slide, I think. Um, the other organisation, which is kind of a, a sub-level of this, is, is the Canterbury Climate Action Partnership. And, and do have a look at the website, um, www.ccap.org.uk. Um, this is something we set up about three years ago, which I've been chairing up, uh, up to now. Um, and it's, it's, it's a community interest company, legally, but it operates on a shoestring. But the, the great thing about it is it has all key local stakeholders engaged. So we have our, not just the, the city government, city council, we have the churches, we have the um, community groups, we have the residents association, we have the three universities in Canterbury, and we have um, also the businesses, important, uh, our business improvement district. So all the key stakeholders are, are jointly engaged, and the city has set a, a, a collective target of having zero carbon by 2045, which is actually five years earlier than the national target, and we're trying to get everybody to move in that direction. Uh, we're also heavily into the citizen awareness issue, for example, in two weeks' time, we're going to give um, local climate action awards for the best school projects, for the best university projects, for the best um, community projects, for the best businesses who are committed to climate change in the broad sense, whether it's carbon reduction plans, or, or biodiversity or other, other related issues. So that's another great way of raising awareness. And we've supported some grassroots projects, like we have a, a local repair cafe, um, a plastics-free initiative and things like that. And as I say, we've got this target of 2045. So really, that's, that's I think, some interesting examples of, of what can be done with often very, very minimal resources. And um, I think, um, I'd, I'd be very interested in having a discussion with, with colleagues um, about your experiences and, and you know, learning what you've been doing here, uh, what you think about some of these ideas. And, and thank you very much again for having me along, and, and uh, it was lovely to interact with you. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you, Carl. Right, so. I'm sure there must be a lot of questions for Carl. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, other from uh, those online, have your questions ready for Carl? Uh, yes, at the back. Um, you do our sort of UK, UK and Richard yeah. 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 Yeah.
help guide the yes. SDG implementation. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and our representatives at the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly so UK president. Okay, well, I'll do it in two parts. Um, yes is the answer, certainly in terms of the... I mean, the UN set a, a formal framework, and um, the country reports which I mentioned, the, the uh, voluntary reviews, which, need to be, which each country is obliged to make, each government is obliged to make, um, follow a certain format, uh, but there are also strong recommendations that the national government, in making those reports, consults with other stakeholders, so it's not just a question of ministries or Whitehall, but you know, it's not, even not just local government, they're also supposed to consult with wider civil society and feed that into their national report, which you know, by and large ha has been done by, by most countries. Um, obviously, the, the UK representatives in New York have a responsibility to monitor those things, to feed back the information. Uh, but a lot of this is public. I mean, the UN is one of the, to my mind, most transparent organizations. I mean, if you go on the, the websites on SDGs, you'll find there's a huge swathe of reports of every possible country yeah. um, and, and the guidelines which are involved. So it's all very transparent. Um, and, and the only question is, you know, national governments following the guidelines and how, how thorough they are and how serious they are about it. But most countries, I would say, are, are pretty serious about it. Uh, as I hinted, I think the UK could do a, a bit more, frankly. <laughs> Uh, at, at, at national level to, to push these things. And also, I think the awareness raising where the UK has really fallen down is to get the message across. You know, the, the kind of SDG discussion we're having today should be just something which the UNA is doing. It's something the U UK national government should be doing or encouraging and giving resources which other governments have done. And that's why there's such a lot of lack of awareness uh, among people about this. You understand? Related to that, unless there's somebody online. Um, I remember back in 2015 when the SDGs were being talked about before that, um, <clears throat> there was a certain amount of concern, I suppose, that actually the way it's structured is there's no um, enforcement, as it were. Countries can, can kind of do it if they want, whereas a lot of other UN agreements you know, are, are kind of part of. Uh, international law kind of thing and there are you know we have rights and things like that um, and yet it seems as though actually there is a, kind of a drive to meet the SDGs um, so if you got any I suppose, any view any comment on you know how much does do the SDGs work because of this kind of idea that everybody is trying to do the best they can or how do they not work because actually there's nothing to hold anybody to account for mm -hmm. and what's the kind of balance of that mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're right, Jason's there. Yes. Uh, you're, you're right about um, so the first point. Um, I mean, it, isn't, it isn't a legally enforceable agreement, it's, it's not a treaty in that sense. Um, having said that, it has been signed by its government, it has been you know, agreed by the UN General Assembly. It does carry political weight, uh, but it doesn't have the, the strict enforceability, uh, as you rightly say. However, uh, I'll put two things against that. Uh, one is where, where the UN has been very clever <coughs> is, is engaging the wider stakeholders, you know, the NGO community, the local governments. And I mean, I was involved, as I said, in, in some of the local government work. And I remember quite a few meetings of very, very senior mayors, you know, big city heads going to New York, and not just New York, but elsewhere. Uh, we had meetings which I was involved with of, of UNDP in, in different places around the world where they brought together the, the local communities, the mayors, the NGOs, uh, particularly on this, this localization issue. So there's been a real sort of grassroots drive by the UN to engage beyond the sort of formal diplomatic level, which I think has really helped move things forward. Uh, and of course the other issue is that, that there's lots of cross-references. You know, the, um, I mentioned the um, SDG on, on growth and employment. Um, although it's not quite explicit, it, it does relate very much to the ILO standards on, on decent work, on things like child labor and so on. So um, it, is, it is sort of indirectly enforceable because it brings in then some of the legal conventions like on child labor or, or, or other things which, which collective bargaining, which, which the ILO has, has, has um, the governments to sign up to. So indirectly, but I think ultimately it's to do with peer pressure. I mean, it's a bit like the climate stuff, you know, it's, 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 um, it's having that international momentum. But frankly, what worries me, and this is another discussion, <laughs> 
but it's, it's very relevant, is, is more the political trends in the world, what we've seen in Holland recently, in Netherlands, uh, what we saw in Argentina, uh, what we've seen in, in this country over, over Brexit and some of the far-right anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, and I think that is what's undermining the, the commitments rather than the, the broader framework and the way it's been constructed. Mm -hmm. and Mr. So, Mr. Mr. Trump, of course, I should add, add as well. <laughs> Uh, Barry has a question or has, has his hand up. Can you Barry? Yourself? Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I may say so, uh, I enjoyed your talk very, very much. I, there was many things that I, I think I already knew, but you already opened up some new ideas to be pursued after, after this meeting. Uh, one question I'd like to ask is that you, you mentioned about frameworks. Um, the framework, a framework for sustainable development of any program on any of the SDGs is something which is fundamental to, to the way we operate in the central region and also in the uh, Shropshire UNA. Um, the interconnection between all of the end SDGs is, is very apparent to, to most people. Do you have any advice or comments to make about the value of, of frameworks for how you implement it, not just what you implement, but how you do it? Yeah. Um, well, again, I, I won't go into all the sort of technical details, but as I said, it's worth looking at some of the, there's quite a few guides, quite a few um, implementation frameworks which have been devised by, by different organizations, some of the international local government bodies, um, the UN itself, and, and um, there, there's a, a kind of a matrix which, which you can adopt, uh, which allows you to take some of these things forward in a very practical way. and, and explains how you do it. And I, I, if I got the question right, I think I, I touched on some of that when I talked about, you know, a county or a government, local government taking a, a local plan and seeing how those those existing commitments and targets at the local level can be related to the SDG targets. Uh, but there are some quite standard procedures in doing that um, and taking it forward. And it, it extends, as I say, I, as I have focused very much on, on local government, but you know, I think, I think civil society, as I said, bodies like the UNA uh, have a role in partnerships. I mentioned already the, the linkage we have in, in Canterbury and, and in Tebe in Uganda. And it's, it's great online to see my, my dear old friend, um, Jane Knight, who I knew as Councillor Jane Knight uh, in the old days, uh, who of course was very instrumental in the work we did in the Commonwealth in, in Bo in Sierra Leone. And as it happens, Jane, I was just with the not the mayor of Bo, but the mayor of uh, Freetown in, in, in Kigali. <laughs> but um, there again is an example of, of something that can be done with partnership under SDG 7, something very practical, something very engaging in terms of um, partnership working at the civil society level as well as the more formal governmental uh, implementation. And, and maybe just one, one final thing, uh, I, I did say already that a lot of these things that the SDGs relate to other things, <laughs> Uh, as things always the case with you, and it gets a bit complicated. But um, one other thing I didn't mention, I think is worth throwing in, is something with a rather grandiose name, the Addis Ababa uh, Action Program, if I remember the correct title, which is very much focusing on financing for development, financing the SDGs, getting commitments uh, from governments, uh, from the private sector and from others to really drive things forward. Uh, so there's lots of these interconnections and, and as I say, what I'm really trying to push is the idea that it's not just a theoretical, you know, UN airy fairy kind of thing, but something really, really down to earth, bottom up uh, way to approach sustainable development. Thank you. Yes, um, we do, with climate change, we do. I mean, with the local authorities, it is working. I mean, with both the county council, Wallachie County Council, and the district council have their portfolios on, on the environment and climate change. And each authority, both the, the county council and the district, have um, a, a sort of a, a named officer on climate change. 
but I think we need to actually now uh, make them aware about the SDGs. Climate change in the last 20, 30 years has been the sort of driving force trying to get uh, local governments engaged and I think we're more or less, we're now there but it's the uh, sustainable development goals which the, I don't think the public is are aware that they're interconnected and, and this is where we need to educate not only ourselves but our ca elected councillors that's what you are driving, that's what you've been doing in Canterbury. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and I think you know, climate change always gives you a really good way in because, as I mentioned, it's not only the, the goal on climate, you know, SDG 13, it, it's quite, a, if not all the other goals which are interrelated, you know, on consumption, on, on poverty, on, on all these things, uh, you know, they have an impact on, on climate. Mm. So I think it's a very way, good way in. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, maybe having a session with interested councillors, having yeah. something at the town hall, would be a good way forward or you know a wider public meeting on, on that and as I say have a look at what Bristol's done. Bristol's one of my, my star pupils. <laughs> they've, they've done some great stuff on, on SDGs yeah. as well as climate so it's worth, worth looking at that. Anthony has a question online. Any more questions from yeah, Anthony? Go ahead. I think you're muted. Oh, yeah. uh, you muted Anthony, I think. Oh, is, is that Anthony? Yeah. Can't, can't hear you, Anthony. I think, I think you're muted. Or at least we're not hearing you. <laughs> Can we hear you? Try again. Got an echo. Can you hear you? Nice. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that sounds better, I think. Oh. No? Go ahead. Unless you can put the question on the chat, maybe? Gian, leave yours because you'll get a, an echo. We just need actually yeah. to unmute. Mm. Mm. Ian, can you mute yours, please? Can you mute, please? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, how are you aware? Um, in a year or two ago, in um, 2022, um, the, the Labour Group of UNA in the Southeast region had a policy conference. And one of the things we recommended was a resolution on the SDGs and for the UK who had done a launching national year of 2019 but then another one in 2024 uh, a few months later we did get a response back from from Commonwealth office that the UK had no intention of doing another uh, voluntary national review and it was quite disappointing because we'd suggested 2023 we were in 2024 um, pre election and then the list of countries for 2024 was countries from Austria and Argentina, which is in Barbary, including such a lot of places as Palestine, Syria, and Yemen. So it seems pretty strange if the UK can't, can't do it, yet all those places can. Um, but anyway, the so question is what, what could we do, Carl, to encourage um, the UK government or perhaps a new government after the election to take this again a bit more seriously? including doing the um, voluntary national review as, as well as um, the encouraged local government um, after the next government relations in May next year. Yeah, thank you Anthony. Um, no, very good oh, question and I, I, I do... Could you speak into the camera? Ah, sorry. Yes. I, I do agree with Anthony that um, the UK has been very slow as I've been saying throughout the speech really and I remember when the first UK um, review was put in, which has been put in, I think, three or four years ago, um, and so another one, as, as you rightly say, is, is overdue. Um, I think the UK was one of the last countries at that time to produce a, a, a review, so I guess they're following the same sort of rather lax approach this time. But um, what can we do? Well, I think, I think ultimately it's political action. Um, I mean, there is a, there is a standing committee um, on, on SD sustainable development 
in Parliament, which is is um, co-chaired by um, uh, Lord Jack McConnell, uh, former Scottish Labour First Minister. So that's one starting point, and they do events and meetings. So and it's worth looking at which are the members of that that select committee uh, in, in in Parliament and see how far you can lobby those. But I, I think start with your local MPs, start with your local councillors. Um, you know, raise it at meetings. You know, go to the um, MPs surgery and, and try and make them aware or write to them um, that this is an issue for for you know us locally, and we want them to to raise and, and certainly you know there is I hope going to be a change of government uh, soon, and, and and that would be another opportunity. Though I, I worry a bit about the the sort of. Uh, Issues around uh, resources and spending constraints. Any questions? Barry seems yep. to have his hand yep. up. I don't know whether that's the old hand or the new hand. Is anybody in the room? No. Philip? Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, a question for um, Carl. You mentioned about what you're doing in Kent. Who would you regard as the benchmarks for progress in UNA? nationally, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and England and Wales. Which branches or regions or groups are the benchmarks for progress? Well, good question. Um, <laughs> I, uh, well, certainly present company I think is, is doing some great stuff here in, in, in Warwick, certainly. Uh, and, and I think, I think you know, uh, Scotland has also done some good stuff. Um, UNA Scotland, I think, has been quite engaged on, on some of these issues and also on climate. Um, I know some of the, the South East laser groups have done, done work. So I think, I think you know, a lot of groups have done, and, and UNA nationally, um, a couple of years ago, published some quite detailed booklets when I was trustee um, on, on SDGs. And I think, I think maybe it needs to do a bit more political action uh, as well as the sort of publishing stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I think. I think it, it's really, um, you know, uh, difficult to say one particular group, but I think certainly a, a number of others, including Warwick, have done great work. Okay. So you said that the, Con the Canterbury Climate Action Partnership is giving awards. Can you tell us a bit about what the awards consist of, please? Certainly. Um, it's something we only started last year, and it's linked to something we're calling the uh, Canterbury Climate Action Festival, which is, is an attempt to... Um, you know, really raise public awareness about climate and related sustainability, biodiversity issues. And I mentioned the the CCAP, kind of a climate action partnership, that there's two important words in that, that title. One is, uh, is action and the other is partnership. And, and we're very much focused on, on practical action, uh, which I'll come to, and, and the partnership I mentioned where we bring together all the local stakeholders and it's really an umbrella body, so what we try and encourage is the business community through the Business Improvement District, uh, the, the universities with their students and the local schools to do projects or to submit for an award for us to recognise those projects. Um, I mean, we, we, we haven't got money to, or, you know, prizes to give them like the Earthshot, but we give them a nice certificate and, you know, people really appreciate that. And, and so we have different categories of awards, uh, as I said, primary education, secondary education, business, community groups, individuals, uh, if I've forgotten anybody, I think that's about it. Um, and then we go an overall award, and last year uh, we gave the overall award, you, you may have heard of this, um, to a very, very great innovation in, in our district, which is the uh, Wildwood Trust, which has brought back the bisons into the UK, you might have seen it on television. And, and the great thing about the bisons is that they're big creatures, uh, but they trample down the, the, the the saplings, which is slightly counterintuitive, but actually it, it creates, all the saplings tend to be monocultural conifers, mm -hmm. so it actually creates space for a much more diverse biodiversity, and, and therefore it's a kind of rewilding project. Um, so those are the kind of things we, we like to, you know, award, highlight, but it's also a great way to get the public engaged, to get different groups engaged, and we, we don't have to do so much, you know, we get our partners to do the Donkey work, and we have to bring together the actual uh, you know, awards ceremony where we get the mayor and the Bishop of Dover and the local MP coming along. So it gets a bit of PR. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's a good way to publicise the issues around, around climate and wider sustainability. I think Jane uh, got her 
a bit late and you may have already said this, but I'm just going to say, I think Warwick District Council is very close out of ground to um, take the SDGs to, because they've got um, the climate change policy and mm. various committees dealing with it. And the, the um, Ian Davidson, the chair, I mean the, uh, what is he, the leader, he's the green man, and Chris King, who is his deputy, is also a green, and very much tuned into One World Link and so on. So I think he got an opportunity there, he could either get, get someone to speak at a council meeting and present this, or you could lobby them, get them to put it into their committee if they're doing this. Anyway, it's nice to see you again, Carl, after all these years. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. <laughs> long time. I remember, I remember you, um, was it you and your colleagues one time getting stranded in a, a third-hand hovercraft off, off the Freeport, Freeport uh, Harbour and jumping into the water to get, get to on land? <laughs> was, that, was that some other colleagues of yours? Maybe it was the, maybe it was the, maybe it was the Freeport, Freeport people from Hull, yeah. Freetown. Freetown. Free Freetown, of course, yeah. Freetown, yeah. Maybe it was the colleagues from, yeah. from Hull, yeah. But anyway, anyway, still very much linked up with Bo after 42 years. Very good, very good. Well, keep it up. And, and yeah, no, I mean, just to underline what Jane has said, uh, nothing we did in Canterbury recently, having got the, the climate stuff, you know, officer appointed, lead councillor, climate emergency, climate action plan agreed by the council, um, climate targets integrated into the local plan. Um, we, we now pushed on biodiversity. And there was a sort of a separate biodiversity network, which of course links into the climate issues, and that lobbied the council to also declare a biodiversity emergency um, in line with some of the recent UN declarations, and, and that was achieved. And now the, the council set up a, a committee of councillors looking at biodiversity and you know how that impacts on, on its policies and planning. So I think a lot can be done with sympathetic councillors, whether they're green or other parties, and, and obviously it's, it's good to keep a across party consensus. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Um, sorry. Yeah, a big issue, and I know everything is interlinked, as you mentioned, but a big issue in, in local government, and as you said, has to do with central government. It's not some issues. The local government either, either doesn't have the resources or work for a local council, or they don't have the last say because national government takes over, and we know that. Either it's funding or decisions. One of them is planning. Unless they change planning, I mean, we can talk about climate change all day long, but unless planning laws change and other laws change, there's not much you can do um, because they will continue with the wrong way of building urbanization or whatever other buildings come into place. So I just, it, yeah. it, it's just an observation. That's yeah, all. yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and frankly, you know, having worked internationally in Europe and Commonwealth and beyond, um, I would put my neck out and say that the UK is probably, certainly in Europe, the most centralised country in Whitehall, um, mm -hmm. other than maybe Hungary. I mean, that's pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, other, other local governments in, in Holland, in France, in Germany, in Sweden have much more powers and financial access, and that's one of the malaise, I think, malaise which, which prevents local government in the UK from moving forward on these things. It's not just resources, it's, it's powers, it's competencies, oh. and, and that needs to change. It's begun to change a little bit with the elected mayor's uh, system, and, and I mentioned you know, uh, some examples of that, and, you know, but, but I think, I think it, that, that is underlying one of the, the big problems in the UK is the, the lack of powers uh, and, and financial means at the government level compared to other countries, even, even in Africa and places. Oh, hello. Um, I, like Jane um, and other friends here, involved with One World Link. So, you, as you know, Warwick District is linked with Bow District in Sierra Leone. Yeah. And through our primary schools, we've been doing quite a lot of work based around the global goals. <coughs> uh, for children, we tend to refer to them as global goals rather than sustainable development. It's just a bit more child-friendly. Sure. And it's been a real wake-up call to me today that we're halfway through this 15-year mm -hmm. period. And why is it I'm still going to schools who've never heard of them? So there's not enough kind of information out there at an educational higher level saying these are important kids, teenagers need to know about them. Uh, the, the work might be going on. There's plenty of eco, green flag, 
um, biodiversity work going on, but they don't realise that they're feeding into this bigger picture that connects them internationally. And I think that's a real, you know, they're missing out there. Uh, but I like the idea of rewarding schools that are doing really good work, uh, maybe on a, a local district level, rather than mm -hmm. having to apply to the green flag, which is a national award. Yeah. Why not apply to some reward, award within our council um, and showcase that locally and act as a good example? Um, but we have had our funding cut from the British Council, as you know, the, yeah. um, when the government cut development money, the British Council pulled out of Sierra Leone. So we no longer have connecting classrooms money, so we can't do the, the project exchange work in as an effective a way as we could when we, didn't, when we had money. We're still trying to do it, but funds are, are restrictive. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, schools are so important, uh, and the education for generally universities, education colleges. Uh, when we did the awards for the first time last year in Canterbury, we, we had a number of, uh, I think it was a secondary and, and actually many primary schools which were doing nice little projects on, you know, green things, um, and, and what was so nice when we did decide the best, the best ones, and it was a great, great choice of things, we, we got the pupils to come up, the students to come up to the stage with their teacher, and you know, they really loved you know, being in a big audience, getting acclaim, and you know, I, I think that's a super way, the parents were there, so it has that spreading out effect. So I, I would very much um, you know, commend you for doing the work at the school's level, and, and we're trying to do a little bit, as I mentioned, in Canterbury, um, particularly with the, with the links. We have the same problems, of course, of funding and some of the links within TV have been online. Uh, we haven't been able to have a sort of proper exchange as such. But, you know, one of these days we'll, we'll get there. Another question from Barry online. <laughs> Could I ask if you have any information about the Uni uh, United Nations System Staff College in Turin and Bonn that run free uh, learning programs online for for um, anyone who was in, who would register. Yeah, no. Well, th thanks for mentioning that. I, I did mention that. No, I mean, there's so much available online. I mean, I mentioned some of the other sources. You know, WW localizing the SDGs, for example, uh, local SDGs, um, the UN stuff. But but certainly, what happens in Turin and in Bonn is, is very relevant. And again, this question maybe getting that out to schools, getting out to universities, others, and, and to individuals who are interested. And maybe that's something UNA can do as well, is to identify with help of people like Barry, um, you know, what are some of the resources available, and circulate that so people can follow it up themselves. That would be really useful, I think, practical thing to do. Um, uh, yeah, very good point. Thank you, Barry. Is that something where, if there's a link to where these resources are online, that maybe Ian, you could share them with the yeah. <coughs> the uh, mailing list? Yeah. One more question for me, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. I'll, I'll provide Ian with that information that you just asked. That'd be great. Um, when you're talking about the the, Canter the work in Canterbury, you talked about there being a net zero target for uh, 2045. Mm. Um, how much of that is about reducing emissions, um, and how much of it is is about kind of offsetting? And that, you know, we probably all know that you can, own, however much you want to reduce emissions, there's always going to be a residual amount left. But what what is the balance in that target? Yeah. I'd have to refresh myself on, on the latest council plan, which is currently being I think we worked. Um, but I mean, it's a it's a district wide plan, obviously. obviously. Um, and of course, it's it's um, it has different components. I mean, the, the, the three major sectors, I guess, in, in Canterbury are the um, uh, you know, which, which are sort of local businesses. Uh, and there's a real problem there because many of them are SMEs, small small you know, enterprises, and Canterbury, being an old historical town, um, has a lot of very old, drafty buildings, and they're not easily convertible or uh, good suitable for heat pumps. Um, there's obviously the whole residential element. Uh, we've got quite a spread out population in the cores in Canterbury, but we also have the, the coastal towns, Whitstable, Home Base, or the villages. So it's a, it's a diffuse area uh, trying to bring all that in. And of course, there's this, this business itself, uh, and a business I mentioned already. Uh, there's, there's some of the public institutions, rather like, like the universities. The University of Kent has a very large estate. So, so all those have their targets. What I think we're trying to do is to get the 
the key components, the business sector, the universities, the council itself with its perhaps rather smaller fleet of British parliaments to implement plans to, to move forward. So it's being done, um, as I, I'd have to check on the exact balance, but clearly you're right, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, that I think the focus is very much on, on the actual reductions rather than trying to, you know, fit it in ways. Thank you. Yes. Um, I don't know whether your Kent um, Wildlife Trust is involved in any of the projects you have in Kent, but in Warwickshire, the Wildlife Trust is extremely active involving people. It has much more an emphasis now on involving local people in what they are doing, whereas it used to be much more of the professionals with a few volunteers. But now they're, they're doing a lot in schools to um, introduce our ideas of biodiversity and, and active um, things that they can do. And also a lot of, a lot of the general public being involved in, in projects um, like the river that runs through Coventry, they're restoring it a lot. And it's, it's engendered a huge amount of interest. Um, and I think this is something that, that um, all wildlife trusts should be doing. I don't know whether they all are. I think it's a general policy of, of um, SPNR um, that they should. But um, I'm, I must commend the Warwickshire Wildlife Trust for the work that it is doing. It, it is so people-oriented, and it must be influencing a much wider range of public. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And I think all organisations really need to have that aspect of their, their work, you know, whatever they are, uh, including, you know, private, private sector uh, companies. Um, I mentioned the, um, the award we gave to the um, Wildwood bison rewilding project, yes. well that was actually, I should have perhaps mentioned, linked in with the, the, um, the Walker Wild Wildlife Trust yes. in, in Kent, so it was a kind of a collaboration with them and there they were encouraging the, the rewilding and, and getting the public engaged. Um, so, so yes, that's the answer, yes, I, I think they're trying to do the same in Kent. Good, thank you. Any more questions? Yep. Uh, a very minor initiative that I thought spoke volumes for my little local town is that in the, in the office in the middle of town, they have a heat camera that you can borrow for a couple of days and they show you how to use it and you point it at your house and it shows you where the heat is coming out or where you're well insulated and then you return it. It's free of charge. And it, I mean, there's 24,000 in our town, and that's something that I don't know how many people know about, but it seemed to be a very small, practical, local thing where you have one camera that serves the town, and, you know, it, 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 it allows initiatives to come from it. It's an enabling tool, mm -hmm. um, very small in itself, but I think practical. Um, and. It, it's part of the of the network that the they, they of things the town is. It's quite hard to find practical things that you can implement with that don't involve tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pounds. Um, you know, you can plant bulbs, you can have no May, you can put a few hedgerows in, you can try and put cycle paths in, but then the costs start escalating, and it, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. That's a br br brilliant idea, and you know, some of these little simple, small things are so important that they can build up, you know, a thousand flowers bloom. Of course, you know, giving seeds for wild flowers to encourage wild wild flower gardens, as opposed to manicured lawns. You know, all these kind of things are, are really important. So I think that's a, a great initiative. And you know, I'm always very humbled when I go to countries like um, Rwanda, where I was um, last week. Um, Rwanda's had a bad press for obvious reasons, and there are political issues, but um, at, at the sort of local level, yeah, things are really, in many ways, quite interesting. For example, they, um, they, they, they ban all plastic bags in the country. It's illegal to have plastic bags, and not just pay for them, but illegal to have plastic bags. They have a, a, a car-free Saturday in, in Kigali, um, and there's a number of other things that, that go on, which, you know, uh, I think some of the more positives 
about countries you know, which have limited resources, and certainly in the UK where we have more resources, despite all the problems we've mentioned, I think those kind of very simple initiatives, um, you know, finding sources of heat emissions, um, or leakage rather, is it, it, really important, so that's a great example, thank you. Our Allotment Society um, gave, um, sorry, I'm jumping in. Mm -hmm. Our Allotment Society gave every um, plot holder a packet of wildflower seeds to plant last year. And Perfect. many people did. Well done. Mm -hmm. On the other end of the scale, have you got any information about the Global Plastics Treaty? Which the, I know many governments are trying to <coughs> do something effective which will actually make a difference sort of from above top down, because it's all very well us not using plastic bags, but that's not going to make any difference if the governments allow plastic bags to carry on being made. So... Well, that's the great thing, as I mentioned, that Rwanda has, has banned the, the use altogether, you know, I mean, obviously this will be made elsewhere, but you're right, I think that, that treaty, the colleagues are familiar, I mean, I'm not expert on it, but um, I think it was an important step in the right direction. You know, if, if you go, it's so pitiful, and you know, you don't have to watch David Attenborough to see this. I've been on beaches in, in Commonwealth developing countries um, where there's been massive plastic washed up on the beach, and it's just pitiful. And uh, that's got to be tackled. You know, it's destroying our marine environment, destroying our fish. So I think we, we do need more enforcement. We do need government action at national level. We need legislation to really drive this forward. It's no good just relying on voluntary goodwill. Yes, yes. Uh, I was very interested in the thermal camera, but I'd be more interested if the, in the same local authority where they're building large numbers of houses, there would be a few solar panels mm -hmm. visible. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. No, no, I mean, uh, I, again, I think this is where there should be legislation or local planning laws which make it obligatory for any new development to have that. Uh, you know, and I think that's, that's really, really important to enforce these kind of things. And you know, it's not a big additional obligation. In fact, would benefit uh, a lot of those house building initiatives. To totally agree. And if you do it when they're being built, it's virtually no extra expense. It's when you have to then add them up. Exactly. Right. Yeah. My understanding of some of the local developments around this area, because we've got quite a lot, is that some of the houses are um, being built under the control of the local authority, and they do have solar panels, they do have heat pumps. But I think most, or certainly quite a lot, are, are just by private house builders. And, and I suppose because of there being no national legislation, they're not so having they're those because the they're, they're building them to the minimum cost so they can make maximum yeah. profit. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is one of the problems that um, I suppose if we do need to build lots of houses, probably a lot of it is going to be done by private house building companies simply because of capacity. But without the, the right regulations and the right enforcement, they're not going to do those things. Even if local authorities do with the ones they control, it's only going to be a, a small amount of it. And, and perhaps just one thing to throw in, and I mentioned in Canterbury we have this um, climate action partnership. Um, we, we also have a small subgroup, or two subgroups, one dealing with transport advice, you know, and things like highways and so on, uh, climate aspect of, of emissions from, from cars and so on, and public transport. But also we have a, a subgroup of archi local architects who are just giving their voluntary time to advise on exactly those kind of things like building standards, the, it's called the passive house sort of a standard of, of, of you know, high insulated housing. So again, I think getting people who've got knowledge together, making them input, supporting the council and understanding those, those kind of things is really important. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the problems that one seems to have in all these environmental things is to join things up. I know, for instance, the local council has imposed regulations on people attending fairs, festivals, or street traders that they can't have plastic bags unless they are biodegradable or whatever, and that all your mugs have to be compostable. But then when you try and recycle them into the normal composting things, um, they don't want them because it takes longer to compost one of those containers than it does to compost your garden rubbish. So they ask you to put it into landfill 
unless there's a separate stream in your particular area, which there isn't in ours. Um, it, it's a real catch-22, and half of these things, I mean, my fisherman has gives me uh, plastic bags which say biodegradable on them, but it, it means they go into little pieces, and you can't put them into the plastic bag recycling, and you can't put them, you know, it, so again, they end up in landfill. There's, there's not the joined up talking when they design these things as to how they go into the recyclable streams. Um, it, it messes up the systems they've already got in place when these new materials come in that haven't been thought through or integrated. Uh, and somehow, somewhere, you need that talking in the planning of these new materials and how they fit in, it, it's yeah, no, no, I mean, yeah. very frustrating because it costs the traders money yeah. to put these new materials in, but then it doesn't work. Two, two quick points. Um, one is we, we had um, Lord, Lord Dennis, um, who went recently was the chair of the official climate um, committee of the government's climate advisory committee. Um, and in Canterbury recently at a, a talk I organised, and he was very, very critical. Former John Sullivan Gummer, so one of the older people might recall, who has got very kind of radical in his old age. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, he, he was actually very, very critical of, of lack of government progress on, on climate and wider issues. And I think this is a good example where, you, again, come back to the point the colleague here made, where we need stricter legislation, we need stricter prescription for these kind of things. And a joined up approach sometimes actually might, might mean things are cheaper actually. Uh, as you say, and my, my final point maybe is, is just to something again perhaps I think we should be aware of. And again we've tried to do a bit in, in Canterbury. Um, th there is obviously a cost, there's a cost to um, small traders who, who haven't got much resources, small businesses. Um, there's a cost if you want to put in a heat pump or a solar panel. You know, if, if you're a household who's struggling to meet the cost of living, energy costs, you know, you're not going to have the money to do this. And, and what we're trying to do is see how can we advise people, particularly from less fortunate citizens, um, what are the grants available, what's the support available, uh, and that is so critical. So, I mean, same with the UNIS issue uh, in London, you know, um, one of the really disingenuous things about the government was that they, they, they used it as a political issue to attack Mayor Sadi Khan, yeah. and of course, unlike some other cities where the central government had given grants to allow the transition, uh, they, they withheld grants from London. Um, uh, so so Khan had to find some money from his own coffers to allow people to have some subsidy to change their vehicles. So, so you know, I think this is one of the mm -hmm. unpleasant things that we're moving away a little bit from, from the consensus on, on climate, on sustainability and politicizing some of these issues in a, in a in not very productive nature. So I think we do need to pay attention to public opinion to explain to people why it's important, but also give them help if they're struggling with, with finances and with the cost of living. Well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, so our uh, hour is up, I'm afraid. Um, having listened to the conversation and question in the last 40 minutes, uh, it, it sort of emphasized to me how interactive the, uh, the 17 SDGs are. Right, they all sort of interlinked with the sort of questions uh, we've uh, asked Carl on climate change, on biodiversity. Uh, you know, it's it's all part and parcel of the same uh, uh, same coin. So, um, Carl, thank you very much indeed for uh, uh, coming and speaking to us and uh, giving us uh, some food for thought and uh, see uh, what we can do and approach um, our local. Uh, district Council and see if they're aware of the SDGs and, and also sort of work out uh, how much has there been sort of achieved uh, in, uh, in real terms. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.